The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Well, let's uh, give you a very warm welcome. It's about the only thing that I can give you that's warm today, because uh, sitting here in the UK, it is freezing. It feels colder than it was at the World Economic Forum in Davos, and there, um, unusually, the, the weather in the Swiss Alps was above zero. Here it's now minus two as we speak. Anyway, that's not what we're worrying about. We are much more interested in our hot portfolio, and we're going to be giving you insights into that in the next hour. Um, but first, uh, Stuart, you've got some technical issues. Stuart Lohman is our managing editor, and he's in Johannesburg. Yes, thanks a lot, Alec. Always good to be here. I just quickly, if any, the listeners can please raise their hand. There's a little button there that lets them know that they can see Alec's presentation and hear our voice. So if you can just do that so we know we're, we're good. Okay, excellent. I'll see a few hands. Thanks for that. Um, we do like to keep it quite conversational. Um, please, there's a questions uh, bar on the right-hand control panel. If you just push them through that questions uh, that panel there, I'll pass on to Alec and we can sort of create a conversation as he goes through the presentation. But Alec, I think that's it from my side. Over to you. Perfect. Are you seeing the screen uh, nice and clearly? Uh, in other words, the PowerPoint presentation, is it up there for you, Stuart? Yes, it's perfect. Thanks a lot, Alec. Oh, good. Right. Well, uh, let's get into the uh, portfolio for today. And there it is in US dollars. Well, just let me just give you some of the overall numbers in the last month. In January, the portfolio was sitting at 4.48 million Rand. It's now sitting at 4.31 million Rand. Now, that's uh, a decline in Rand terms. But in US dollar terms, it's gone from $330,000 to $369,000. So it's gone up by almost $40,000 in the month. And uh, the difference then in the RAND is because the RAND has been so potent. The RAND has been extremely strong uh, over the last month, in fact, over the last two months. And that has been the difference in the uh, portfolio. We did say ahead of the ANC elective conference in mid-December that our view was sanity would prevail, Cyril Ramaphosa would win, uh, and that this would strengthen the RAND, but that we weren't going to make any changes to the portfolio uh, on that kind of a decision. And clearly, um, for the most part anyway, the portfolio has performed sufficiently well to offset the decline uh, that you would have seen because uh, when you price it in rands, in fact, you can see it here uh, much clearer as um, the rand has now improved to almost the level it was at when we launched the portfolio in 2014. How's that? So over three years ago, the rand was at 11 rand 37 against the US dollar. It's now at 11 rand 60. So that doesn't take into account inflation differentials or anything really. It shows you that the uh, Cyril Ramaphosa effect has been enormous on South Africa's currency uh, and it is hopefully going to be justified. Despite that, our initial decision with this portfolio was to hedge against the poor economic policies of Jacob Zuma. Uh, we now are seeing far better economic policies uh, that are being implemented by uh, Ramaphosa. We also saw some very welcome returns to the cabinet last night of Ntlantla Nene as finance minister and Prabhin Gordhan as the minister of public enterprises. So we've had that uh, good news to come on top, which helped the RAND in the last 24 hours. But on the other hand, the portfolio in the US has been performing incredibly well. We've been fortunate in that if you have a look at this portfolio in uh, RAND terms, you can see that Vanguard, for instance, which is the market, the overall market, uh, Vanguard is a exchange traded fund, that S&P 500 index that follows the American share market. And that is up by 38% in RAND terms, pretty much uh, a similar uh, increase as you you, as you can uh, be aware, because the rand hasn't really appreciated, uh, depreciated much against the dollar now, going back to the beginning. Uh, and against that, we've had two outstanding performers in Amazon and Alphabet. Uh, and for the rest, uh, Berkshire Hathaway and Tesla. Tesla, a late addition to the portfolio, has done fabulously well. 
Um, but uh, Berkshire Hathaway a little bit better than the market. And then on the other hand, a little worse than the market has been Tencent and uh, Facebook. But those are not really fair comparisons because as you can see there, uh, Tencent was purchased in May 7, 2017, Facebook purchased October no, 2016, whereas we are taking the market overall from December 2014. So there are timing differentials there as well. So not really a direct comparable. Uh, directly comparable but overall the annualized return of the portfolio in rand has been 32 percent in the three and a bit years uh, that we have been uh, in business the major reason for the portfolio's tempering performance in the most recent times has been the rand and i'll just show you these uh, three gra graphs very quickly in us dollars you can see the elective conference just ahead of it the rand was trading at 1450 today at 1160 and that is an appreciation of 20 percent but it's been across the board here you can see an even stronger uh, graph for the rand against the pound uh, in ahead of the elective conference it was 18 and a half it's now just over 16 rands for buy you one pound and uh, here's the hong kong dollar uh, and there you can see a similar kind of a move why do we have the why do we refer to the hong kong dollar well because one of our holdings is 10 cent Ten cent is listed in uh, on the stock exchange in Hong Kong. The other big story about the last month has been the volatility that has returned. In fact, uh, those uh, the volatility has been so low for so long, so tranquil and peaceful, that a lot of people have been making fortunes going short of volatility or the VIX index. That all changed at the end of January, as you can see. Uh, I've used here the VOO, which is the uh, S&P 500 uh, Vanguard uh, ETF. It's the most accurate reflection of the market overall because the costs that are charged by Vanguard for this exchange traded fund are actually four one hundredths of one percent. Uh, it used to be five one hundred. They've managed to even cut it further. So, 0.04 percent is the total cost that you would pay to get into the Vanguard ETF. It's a benefit of uh, or a function of the enormous size of this. Um, exchange traded fund now but as you can see at the end of january uh, the value of the etf went from over 260 dollars all the way down to about 235 but since then it has improved there was quite a big sell-off in the early uh, start uh, of february but as long as you'd held your nerve over this period you'll be looking much better today the individual performances of the portfolio there you have rand dollar in three years a depreciation uh or by the rand of just three percentage points three percent uh and on the other hand the uh, star performers are very easily pointed out there as whereas microsoft metrobank uh, are well, laggards in this portfolio relatively speaking but at least they're still nicely in profit and there's the purchase the profit since purchase uh, and as you can see, the improvement there is, uh, well, Amazon and Alphabet are just way ahead of everything else. Let's get into the individual stocks and uh, some of the stories around them. In fact, um, just to remind you that uh, Stuart's standing by to take any questions. So we do really like to make this an interactive discussion and tend to always have lots of questions towards the end. So any time that you want to stop me, and uh, to have a chat about an individual stock or something that I've said about it, please do. Thanks, Alec. the a, richest man in the world. That's a good point for me to come in then, Alec. Um, just quickly, I know you'll probably get on to it in Tencent, but Benjamin's got a few questions. He says, please elaborate on Tencent and Nuspass and the differential between the two equities. And has Bob found a solution yet? And then he wants to know if he should include both in his portfolio. Yeah, Benjamin, I uh, we have... NASPAS as the dominant stock in our SA Champions portfolio because it is reflective of um, Tencent and it is still trading at a huge discount. Discount has narrowed, uh, but it certainly is, um, it's still in the 30s, way in the 30s uh, on the overall market value of NASPAS relative to its share price. What that means is um, if you were to sell or liquidate all of the assets that NASPAS has today, and uh, put the cash in the bank, it would be worth at least 35% more than uh, what the share price is reflecting right now. Bob van Dijk, the chief executive, 
has been working hard to try and narrow that discount, uh, including on the 12th of December last year, having the inaugural uh, investor show in Roadshow in New York to tell people more about the attractions of the company. It's helped a little, but the RAND's appreciation, remembering that we look at NASPARS in South African RAND terms, has offset that narrowing of the discount. I haven't done the numbers in the last couple of days, but it is still very deeply into the city. So it's still a very good opportunity for value investors. Should you own both? I would be buying NASPARS with RAND that you have in South Africa, um, but using your dollars or Hong Kong dollars to or dollars converted into Hong Kong dollars to buy Tencent. Tencent will give you a much closer reflection of the performance of the company than Nuspass will, because Nuspass, you've got the RAND uh, to come into it, and of course the discount as well. Just to put it into perspective, Tencent's market capitalization has now gone beyond that of Facebook's. It's worth $550 billion. Facebook is at $537 billion. So it, it's catching on with Western investors uh, that the, the value of Tencent and the growth potential of Tencent even bigger than Facebook. But interestingly enough, in this last period, Amazon went past Microsoft into position three of market cap, and they now stand out the, the most valuable companies in the world, and they're all in our portfolio, the top four, are Apple at 908, Alphabet at 794, Amazon at 736, and Microsoft at 734. So there's not a lot between Amazon and Microsoft, but uh, Amazon moving through it uh, into that position. To just sum up on the question that you did ask, uh, would I have both of them in the portfolio? Yes, uh, using offshore or, or hard currencies to buy Tencent, uh, using RANDs to buy NASPERS. And uh, is Bob van Dijk having any progress on contracting that discount? Yes but uh, nothing like the speed at which I'm sure he would like to see it happening. Stu? Thanks, Alec. Just with um, Tencent, uh, Ed wants to know, is there any advantage between buying Tencent on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange or the New York Stock Exchange? You know, I've had a look at that, and the problem with the New York Stock Exchange with the ADRs is they don't seem to trade that freely. So as a result, it's a much better... Uh, decision and with web trader with Santa Bank web trader you can trade in Hong Kong I would just go straight to Hong Kong that's that's the primary market for it to be uh, for the stock to be traded in and then you don't get caught with uh, low volumes which means you have to have a big spread in other words if you want to sell at a hundred uh, if there's very uh, low volume traded in the stock you might find that someone's only prepared to give you 95 Whereas if there's high volumes, you'll probably find someone prepared to give you 99 and a half. So it's much better to, to trade where the trade is made. Uh, Nuspass, for instance, has got ADRs or American deposit receipts, uh, which are available in the US, but they are very, very poorly traded. And you would generally, if you were investing in Nuspass, you'd be going through the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. And it's a similar thing with Tencent. Rather, use web traders' advantage and, uh, and make your investment into Hong Kong. Thanks, Alex. Still on the NASPES uh, discussion, Dominic wants to know, how do you consider capital gains tax when looking at the NASPES discount? It's a similar valuation situation to Yahoo and Alibaba. Yeah, capital gains tax only comes into account when you sell the stock. So that's the, and then uh, with a way that we like to propose and recommend, you shouldn't be selling the stocks within five years and then capital gains tax um, becomes much less of an issue. The average holding period for a share, according to Buffett, and we're going to look at his portfolio a little bit later, is supposed to be forever, but even he has uh, does do quite a lot of trading from time to time, as, as I'm going to show you in his top 15 of the portfolio, of the Berkshire Hathaway portfolio. But uh, it's, it's one of those prices that you should be happy to pay capital gains tax because it means you have made a, made a gain. Uh, many people in this industry, many people who invest in stocks, uh, try to chop and change that regularly. In fact, uh, they try and trade against the uh, those who have much bigger balance sheets and are far better connected uh, to the marketplace. And uh, it, it usually is uh, a bit of a fool's errand to do that. I don't feel that capital gains tax is something that should ever influence your decision to uh, sell a share. 
you should only sell when you have decided there's a fundamental shift in the underlying part of that of that stock and as a consequence uh, that you can invest your money um, somewhere else uh, to give you a better return. Thanks, Eric. Just a follow up from Dominic on that. Uh, the question says regarding NAS, it's regards NASPAS is unbundling Tencent and how CGT would be considered in, val in valuing that discount. I'm not sure if that changes the answer. Uh, it's a theoretical question. Right. At this stage, NASPAS is saying it's not interested in unbundling and it has continued to follow that line for many, many years. So it's it really is theoretical. If it were to occur, um, it would be a huge surprise. But if if that were to happen, we would uh, no doubt the company would would give us all the insights and the details on that. Perfect. Thanks, Alex. We're cracking. Let's keep going. Yeah, here's the richest man in the world, uh, Amazon.com, now worth 736 billion US dollars. And that's been enough to push Jeff Bezos over 120 billion US dollars as the uh, and comfortably overtaken uh, the previous holder of that title is Microsoft's founder, Bill Gates. Mm -hmm. uh, just to um, have a look at the share price, and this is gives you an indication of, of what's happened with that volatility. Even Amazon, even the mighty Amazon came down quite sharply in early February, as you can see there. Uh, but it's been it's back on its its track again, back into a record into record area, and in fact, in the last month, Amazon's been again the star performer in our portfolio. It's put on a hundred dollars a share from when we last uh, spoke in January, mid January, uh, when the share price was fourteen one thousand four hundred seventeen dollars. Uh, last night it closed one thousand five hundred twenty two dollars. Amazon just keeps pulling further ahead. There was an interesting uh, analysis uh, comparison. Uh, that's been brought up between Amazon and Walmart. Now, you might remember that Walmart is the biggest offline retailer in the United States uh, with huge stores. Uh, Walmart is represented in South Africa through what used to be the old Mass Mart. Um, that whole company uh, is is now part of the Walmart group. Um, you, you have game um, uh, Dion's, uh, companies like that or brands like that that are in the uh, in the mass mart stable and the big concern for uh, amazon shareholders was what's going to happen when walmart becomes proficient at selling on e-commerce is it possible with its scale that it could start unraveling the whole amazon magic well it looks like it's going the other way because in the final quarter of last year Amazon, which has a far higher base of e-commerce sales than does Walmart, far, far higher, uh, grew its sales by 24% in the fourth quarter. Walmart, after doing very well in previous quarters, only grew its sales by 23%, e-commerce sales that is, not, not the in-store sales, but the e-commerce sales. And this is being interpreted as Walmart has got an enormous amount to learn uh, before or, or on e-commerce before it can even be thought of catching uh, Amazon and uh, a very bullish point for Amazon as you see the share price just going stronger again. The big story on uh, e-commerce or this fight between Walmart and Amazon which Amazon's winning hands, hands down by the way and has been for years is uh, that toiletries are now starting to come into the, uh, into the point. Um, things like uh, uh, deodorants uh, etc moisturizers and the detergents which in the past were the kind of things that you went into the store to go and buy because they're too cheap too too expensive to deliver um, individually however amazon prime is is um, a, a club that it's put together it costs about 79 dollars here in uh, 79 pounds in uh, in the uk about 99 dollars i think in the us that has been growing like topsy. Uh, it in the last year uh, grew by fifty-one percent, with the revenues generated there of nine point seven billion dollars. And the average Amazon Prime member spends thirteen hundred dollars a year on buying uh, from Amazon. The intention would very soon be to open up even further and bring in detergents and toiletries, the all all manner of fast-moving consumer goods. So it'll be interesting to see how that all pans out. The market is telling you that Amazon's likely to keep winning.
So, Alec, just on Amazon, I know we get this question every month. Um, is it worth buying Amazon now at these levels? <laughs> yeah, it's a good question, Stu. Uh, every time you see the share price going up, Excuse me a minute, I just had a, a little sneeze. Every time you see the share price going up, you wonder if it's the end of the Amazon effect. I don't believe so. Amazon is a company that we've had in this portfolio now from day one. Uh, we bought it in the 300s, so it's put on more than, oh, well, more than $1,100 a share. And it, during all of this period, uh, uh, a classical trader would have said, well, dump it, you know, take your profits and move on. You need to ride your winners in every portfolio. And when you've got a winner like this one, who until you look at the business model and say something's going wrong or something's going to trip them up or um, somebody's going to put a spanner in the works in some way, stick with it. You buy companies, you buy your share, your slice of a company for a particular reason. And the reason at the time will be that you believe in their business model over the long term and that the price is not excessive that you're paying right now. To start imagining Amazon's share price going back to say $1,000 uh, is very, very difficult to see because the Amazon story is now more widely appreciated amongst investors. And until we see a reverse in the momentum that's being built up, and there's a lot of runway still to go for Amazon, in theory, they would, they could, um, still sell all the retail um, or do all of the, the, the retail sales in the whole world. And of course, they only have a fraction of that potential, a uh, fraction percent of that potential. So Amazon is a company with lots of runway. It's a company that is that is a fantastic business model. It is one that as it gets bigger, it gets even more successful. So I would be buying the shares and putting them away and not worrying about them. Just uh, put them on the side and and you, know, you you might see an opportunity like happened in February when the shares came down to uh, 1300 or so. Uh, that would have been a very, very good buying opportunity. But if you have them in your portfolio, hold on to them. If you don't have them in your portfolio, get some. Thanks, Alec. So there we go. We can have a look at that uh, share price. You can see going back to November, when the quarterly results came out there, the share price shot up. Uh, this time around, it, it wasn't quite as, as marked. But uh, after the volatility of uh, early February was out of the way, Amazon was back on its uh, merry um, upward run. Here's a company that's not quite as, as strong a, a long-term bet, I think, as Amazon is. Amazon is just it's going to be very, very hard given where it is for anybody to trip it up. Whereas Alphabet, which has got Google that generates for Alphabet um, about six, 86% uh, online advertising, 86% of its revenues. It is in, a, a, in a, a place where international regulators are looking more uh, closely at big tech and Google, being the major part of, of Alphabet Inc., uh, is, of course, very focused on big tech through online advertising. It, it has a, a, a dominant share there, and the European Union has already challenged them and uh, left them with a, a fine worth more than $2 billion. We also saw a very sharp decline in the share price of Alphabet, as you can see there, in early February. That was after the financial results for the final quarter of last year were, result, uh, were released. That was a 15% drop in the share price from around 1150 uh, all the way down to $1,000. But it's recovered, as has the rest of the market, uh, very strongly since then. And uh, that is because this is the second highest market value company in the world. And it has got a good business model. Is it sustainable? Surely for some time it will be. And that's why we still have it in the portfolio. But if you were asking me, would I be buying Alphabet or Amazon? Uh, I would certainly uh, be leaning towards Amazon at this point. Um, the increase in acquisition of, of traffic uh, costs for Google are becoming apparent. Uh, the publishers are fighting back in various ways. 
and Google uh, Stroke Alphabet is having to change its business model a little, become become more friendly towards the publishers, which in the past it's been able to just aggregate all of their content. It's complicated, uh, and it's a it's a highly complex world. But as far as Alphabet is concerned, and and here we really need to talk about Google and the and the advertising from Google. The cost that it's getting, the cost per click, is continuing to decline. Uh, or in other words, what advertisers are prepared to pay per click through Google is continuing to decline as the supply is infinite. You and I can right now start a new website which would add new pages. And uh, if everybody in the world were to do that, there'd be an infinite supply of pages because we would do it every day and so on. And so that's what Alphabet is fighting against. It's trying all kinds of interesting things. It's got self-driving cars, for instance, which has been widely publicized. It's, uh, it's the leader in that market around the world. And those, it's also going into the cloud computing where Amazon has by far the uh, lion's share and the dominant position having gone in uh, early. So th there are options and there are, one of those could hit in a big way. But as things stand right now, the core business of Alphabet is the online advertising, and that is coming under increasing pressure. It's my, one of my favorite stocks, even though not everybody in the world uh, agrees. Apple's been all over the place, as you can see, a big, big decline uh, in the share price there with the volatility that came up. But interestingly enough, it's back to all-time records again after picking up again yesterday. Uh, Apple is the most valuable company in the world. Our view on Apple is that uh, the network effect here is is enormous. When you buy an Apple computer or an Apple iPhone or become part of the Apple iTunes family, you become part of of a of an environment, uh, an ecosystem that just serves you so very well. Their products are excellent. Um, the the sales of the iPhones, the latest iPhones, the eight and the X or ten have been um, at least in line with the optimistic projections and things are going well in China as well. So Apple's in the good in a good place. And as you'll hear, or you'll see a little later uh, when I spend some time on, on Warren Buffett, it is now the second biggest holding in his portfolio. Tencent, we've uh, spoken a little, that's Pony Ma, uh, not as recognizable a face as Jack Ma, who runs uh, Alibaba.com. But uh, Pony Ma is rated by many as the best entrepreneur in China. And the share price of Tencent reflects that as well. Again, the volatility that came into global markets in early February uh, with a pullback in the uh, stock prices also affected Tencent. You can see it went down back to almost 400 uh, Hong Kong dollars a share. Uh, it has, has shaken that off and uh, continued to steam ahead. The South African connection here is pretty clear uh, with Nuspass owning about a third of the equity in Tencent and Tencent now one of the top 10 most valuable companies on earth. Facebook has a similar kind of challenges uh, if you look for them that Alphabet has got and again you can see that big sell-off that came in early February in the stock. It's recovered not completely though to where it came from and um, part of the reason for this is that for the first time in its history the daily active users in the United States and Canada, in other words, North America, went down in the past quarter when it re uh, reported its results at the end of December. And that got people a little bit worried. It, it does appear as though the growth that Facebook, we've taken for granted from Facebook, is now starting to slow, at least in the mature market. Something else that's really been weighing on this company has the has been its uh, vulnerability to interference. The Russians uh, have taken, appear to have wanted to have um, influenced the US election. They didn't like Hillary Clinton and they were prepared to do uh, some interesting things um, in the online space to ensure that Hillary Clinton did not get re-elected. Uh, the insights on that is that fake news was uh, taken to a whole new level by people from Russia uh, of course, the the winner, um, Donald Trump, uh, who, who beat Hillary Clinton in the shock um, election result, as we re recall, uh, it doesn't believe or he was he was perceived to have been much friendlier towards Russians and and not as harsh on Russian sanctions, etc. Uh, but 
Facebook was right in the middle of all of this and it's had to change algorithms and had to address its business model as a consequence. Something else that it had to do is to hire something like 10,000 cybersecurity staff to make sure there's not a repeat of what happened with the Russians. And that adds a lot to the cost and clearly will be adding uh, to or, or reducing its margin in time to come. So Facebook's another one. Facebook and Google, it's still too early, I think, to sell them, but you have to be aware that they are going through changes in their business model that will make them less appealing in future. This is the S&P 500 index. Uh, again, if you look at that, this is a, a graph of the past year. You can see how the correction uh, or how sharp that correction was uh, in early February, but also what the recovery has been since then. And then Microsoft, again, uh, being influenced by that, uh, the volatility, the, the, the uh, sell-off there, uh, Microsoft is uh, a little higher than where it was uh, a month ago, so it's getting back to all-time record territory. The reason we bought into Microsoft was the new business model that it has introduced, which uh, it's called Micro uh, Windows 36 uh, or Office 365 and Windows 365. You get update, you buy the 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 software once, and it gets updated but you pay either on a monthly or an annual basis uh, part of the automated customer experience which is a very uh, much better option than when your customers have to go into a retail outlet or have to buy online specifically make a date to go and buy online uh, and that's we really like that as a business model uh, and we feel that microsoft will benefit from that in time to come it's been an interesting uh, company, Metro Bank. And I spent a little bit of time, and as you can see, there's a good reason for this. The financial results for the year to end December 2017 came out earlier in, this, in the month. And uh, interestingly enough, the share price went down, despite the fact that the financial results showed a pre-tax profit of 21 million pounds. And this is the first time that Metro Bank has, has reported a profit. It did promise last year when it showed a loss of uh, 12 million pounds at the pre-tax level that it would be aiming to break for at least break even in 2017 or did a lot better than that. And this is a bank that continues to grow very, very rapidly. Last year, its lending was up 64%. Deposits were up 47%. That's hyper growth for a bank that was the first in over 100 years, uh, first high street bank in over 100 years to launch in the UK. And its first branch was uh, opened in 2010. Interestingly enough, they are scaling back on their new branch plans. Uh, the anticipation was that they would get to 110 and then reassess. Now they're saying they'll get to 100 and reassess, but they will be opening 12 new branches uh, in 2018, and that will take the network up to 67. So they're 55 at the moment. 67 branches is where they're looking at the end of 2018, and 1.2 million customers. The reason for the surge in the share price after that pullback on the results is perhaps a reassessment of the results, which in my opinion were very good, um, but also because the company has bought a mortgage book of 523 million pounds from Cerberus, uh, which is a private equity fund in the United States. They concluded this transaction yesterday. Uh, it will help to increase the mortgage book. That's one of the targeted areas for Metro Bank. Uh, and it is, uh, these are high quality properties and high quality lenders apparently um, in uh, London, Greater London and the Southeast of England. So the part of the country that has been less affected so far anyway by uh, economic slowdowns. It does increase the total lo loan book by 5%. And in, a, uh, in the banking sense, when you have scale, it does give you a better margin overall. The one question that remains on Metro Bank is at this rapid rate that it's growing, as you can see, lending, as mentioned, was up by almost two thirds in the last financial year. You generally need additional capital, and then it becomes a, a, a battle of wits between investors who want to try and keep the share price down to, to, uh, when they, so that when they give capital to the bank, they give it uh, they get the best possible return for it. They buy it, buy shares, new shares at the lowest possible price. And of course, from the bank itself, who's wanting to see the share price go as high as possible, 
so that it can issue the least possible shares in the capital that it needs. The chief executive, uh, Williamson, reckons that uh, Metro Bank will have to go back to the market in 2019 to go and raise more capital, maybe even at the end of this year, but that the model, the rapid growth model, is one that is working for them, and they're continuing to focus on hyper growth. One thing that is restricting that growth is tier one capital, uh, and hence the need to go into the market at, at various times and to raise more money. And that was down this year from just over 18% to just over 15%. So uh, Metro Bank is in that interesting situation where you, you know that one day uh, it's going to take off. It's got a pretty uh, modest market capitalization of only three and a half billion uh, British pounds. So when it takes off, this thing's going to be a little bit like a, a, the, the kind of rocket we saw at Capitec. But uh, when that happens is, is anybody's guess. I'm quite happy for us to be sleepers on that one. And here's the stock that I'll spend a little bit of time on. Uh, sorry, Berkshire Hathaway, because Metro, could, uh, sorry, I course. could get you early enough there. Sorry. Um, first just wants, I know we don't really look at PEs in the new fourth industrial sort of way of investing, but Fritz wants to know if the met, what the Metro PE is and if it's used, if it's a concern with you with the investing in the stock. No, not at all. Not with Metro. And the reason for that is that it has just broken into profit. So it's the kind of, it's a kind of company that is uh, focused on growth, it's a bit like Amazon, a bit like Google, where they don't worry about the profits that they put on the table. Um, the fact that Metro Bank is has broken into profit is good because it shows it's got a model that works. But the profit that it's generating is a fraction. Uh, if you look at that uh, twenty. 20, call it uh, 15 million after tax profit, and it's got a market cap of 3,500 million. Uh, so the PE would be sure, would be a few hundred years. Um, that's not what we are uh, looking at in this company. The good news is that it is making a profit. And in fact, if they wanted to maximize the profit, they would just stop growing, they just switch off the growth taps. And uh, that's not part of their strategy at the moment. So profit maximization not the deal there, much more important for them is enterprise or growing enterprise value. And that's a similar uh, story with Amazon. You're looking at Amazon adding to its enterprise value rather than uh, growing the earnings. Uh, and that's the comparison that you need to look at enterprise value in those cases. It's a bit like when you're buying into an investment company, if you can imagine an investment trust. Investment trusts would be well, they'd be receiving dividends and uh, they could decide to distribute those dividends or they could decide to reinvest those dividends. If an investment trust reinvested all the dividends that it got, then you'd have to look at its enterprise value. In other words, the value of its portfolio uh, rather than the income that it's, it's distributing as the uh, basis for valuation of, uh, of that particular stock that you're buying into. It's a very similar situation for the moment anyway with Metro Bank and, and even Amazon who've been at it for many, many years. Thanks, Alec. Let's just uh, go into Berkshire Hathaway. You can see even, even Old Faithful uh, came back after that sell-off in early February. Um, and uh, over the last weekend, Warren Buffett, the founder or, well, the creator, the guy who built it, he didn't found uh, Berkshire Hathaway. That was an old textile uh, company that he acquired control of and just kept the name really uh, and built it into uh, the enormous business that it is today worth 520 billion US dollars uh, in again in the top 10 in the world but why we like to look at Berkshire is not only because it has more than 80 subsidiaries uh, that are in the backbone of the US economy so it tends to mirror what happens in the overall market but also to see what investments that Buffett himself has made and here's his big 15 at the end of 2012 and I found this so fascinating because Buffett's philosophy and I wrote a book on on the subject how to invest like Warren Buffett is that when you buy a share you should be buying it forever but that's not his that, he doesn't practice what he preaches and this shows you because here's his top 15 holdings in uh, at the end of 2012, December 2012. 
Number one, Wells Fargo, it's still in the portfolio. So is the Coca-Cola company. But IBM, which was the third biggest holding, it was 17% of his portfolio. As you see that percentage of the total at the end, were $13 billion. It's no longer in the top 15. American Express is there, but Outgo, Walmart, Munich Re, Procter & Gamble, US Bancorp is there. Outgo, Sanofi, and of course, very famously, Tesco. Moody's is there. Artgo, Conoco, Philips, Posco, DirecTV, and uh, Philips 66, another energy company, is still in the portfolio. So what this is telling us is that of the top 15 stocks that Warren Buffett held at the end of 2012, only six are still in the portfolio. And for a highly focused portfolio, that gives you some very interesting insights into the way that he might um, say one thing, but doesn't always follow the same process himself. And then this is the latest portfolio. So if you have a look at the bottom, the market value of Buffett's big 15 is 170 billion US dollars. Of that, the top 15 are, uh, account for 85, 80, call it 86%. Uh, and then even more than that, even more concentrated than that, is you can quickly have a look at the top five, and the top five will get you to over 60%. Around about almost two thirds of the portfolio is focused in Wells Fargo, Apple, Bank of America, Coca Cola, and American Express. It shows you again here that, uh, that of the top 15, Buffett only owned five of them five years ago. Uh, well, put it differently. He might have owned more, but he only, uh, um, because you can see, for instance, BYD, which is uh, lying in position 14, has come from an investment of 232 million to nearly 2 billion. So it's forced its way into the top uh, 15. BYD is the Hong Kong battery manufacturer, which is uh, a company that we've looked at and never really had the guts to buy. But uh, clearly, Buffett bought it nice and early. And Goldman Sachs is in there as well. It, it had a market value of uh, $6.54. It's gone up to two nine. dollars Moody's um, cost them $248 million. It's now uh, more than a 10-bagger, $3.6 billion. And if you go back to Moody's here, there were 28.4 million shares. Uh, Moody's here, 28.6 million shares. So... It's been the appreciation of the share price and Buffett's love of the company and, and the decision not to sell the company, which has brought Moody's into the preeminent position that it holds there. I think this is a nice uh, a reflection of the world's greatest investor. Uh, and it also tells you that he's gone pretty big on airlines, Southwest and Delta airline, and uh, on banks. If you go from the top, you've got financial services companies, Wells Fargo, of course, Bank of America, American Express, U.S. Bank Corp, uh, Goldman Sachs, Bank of New York, Mellon. Those are all banking companies and uh, a, a pretty dominant side of his portfolio as well. So Warren Buffett's uh, Big 15 uh, makes interesting reading. And uh, I hope that uh, or if you don't really need to write them all down, but you can pick that up from the uh, podcast, uh, which will be on Business News Premium um, in the next couple of days. I really thought long and hard about Tesla and I almost sold the stock because there is so much negative news around Elon Musk. The last set of financial results were really all over the place. He's telling a story, but the story that he's telling at some point in time has to become close to what the reality is. Uh, Musk was, was promising a massive rollout of the Model 3 that hasn't been happening. We were getting feedback on the Model 3, you might recall, the last time we spoke about Tesla. And some of the information was saying, well, they were now getting up to their production targets. But there are many skeptics. It is the biggest short position on the New York Stock Exchange of any stock on the market. There are those who are holding on to Elon's tail uh, so strongly. So far, it's a bit like Bitcoin. Uh, it's it's managed to defy all logic, uh, but it's becoming very high risk now. And uh, my my intention 
at one stage, but I'm not quite sure about, uh, I don't know enough about Alibaba to be able to make the switch, but would be to sell Tesla and to buy into Alibaba. We'll probably do that though uh, in, the next, um, in the next webinar, in the next month. And here it is, just to close off with, to give you the portfolio in rands, we've had an annualized return of 32%, which is extraordinary, um, especially as the rand has done nothing. So we've been invested in the right stocks in the, U in the US. We've made over the period a couple of mistakes, as you well know, um, but fortunately we got out early enough to not really be hurt by IBM. I think we even made a small profit on IBM uh, and uh, Nova Nordisk was another stock that we had in the portfolio early on um, that we are now out of. And we've been really nicely targeted towards the exponential companies and they really have delivered exponential returns. So that's our portfolio for, uh, for this uh, month. And um, Stu, if there's uh, any more questions, we can, we can spend the rest of the time that we have together looking at those. Thanks, Alec. There's a, a, a question that'll probably be picked up rather tomorrow at SA Champions portfolio discussion. But Benjamin wants to know, should Sassel be considered in a global share portfolio? Sure. I, I, I know the company well enough to be able to, uh, to express an opinion. Um, it is highly leveraged towards the petrol price, uh, the South African petrol price. And what that means is if the South African uh, rand appreciates, the value that Sassel enjoys or the price that it gets declines because the international price, the international oil price is priced in US dollars. So Sassel's income is determined in primarily in South African rands. It is a, a, a multinational now and it's growing its international operations, but most of its profits are generated by the Sinfuels operation and the Sinfuels get their income in South African rand. So the more the rand appreciates, the uh, and as it has been doing, the more under pressure Sassel's profits will be. Now they have a hedging program to protect them against this, um, but with the RAND under Ramaphosa likely to be stronger for longer, you then have to look at the other side of that equation and say, are you anticipating that the oil price will rise by more than the RAND will appreciate by? Because Sassel gets its income in RAND per barrel of oil. Okay, so you get, you get the story there. And I don't, I'm not an oil bull. Um, for the simple reason that there are any number of shale gas uh, operations that can be switched back on the minute the oil price starts to threaten 70 or they would love it, $80 an ounce. Uh, a lot of those shale gas operations in the United States and uh, many others potentially elsewhere in the world, including South Africa, which, which has at least the eighth largest reserves, some people say the fourth largest reserves of uh, shale, uh, shale gas in anywhere on earth. So there's the potential to switch that on, not in South Africa, but it's certainly in the US where they've mothballed a lot of the shale gas plants and that'll put a cap on the oil price. So you've got a cap on the oil price. You've got a rand that is like, unlikely to blow out unless there's some crazy event that happens in South Africa and we can never underestimate the potential of that happening. But at least for a period of time, investors are going to give Ramaphosa uh, the benefit of the doubt. So you can anticipate that the RAND will be stronger for longer. Uh, so put that all together. Uh, until Lake Charles comes in, that's the, the, the big uh, chemical plant in Louisiana that they're busy with $11 billion investment, huge investment there. Until that starts kicking in, and then we can start looking at Sassel more as perhaps an international chemicals play or uh, not as big a uh, sin fuels play as it is at the moment. Uh, I think it's being well managed. I think they're doing uh, good things on cutting back the, the costs, etc. But overarching all of that is the idea of the, you actually having a bet on the RAND price of oil. And I wouldn't be too bullish on that at the moment. Thanks, Alec. Um, Rich just wants to know, aside from Alibaba, are there two or three other stocks that you might consider as knocking on the door for the portfolio? 
Mm. I'm always looking at various shares, uh, always reading annual reports, uh, always um, considering where the possibilities might lie. But there's nothing that has jumped out at me yet, like Alibaba. Um, Baidu is is also uh, quite exciting. Um, but you'll hear from both of those that it is looking outside of the traditional portfolio uh, of United um, States stocks, but still looking for exponential opportunities. BYD is another one. Uh, I need to do some more work on BYD. It's, it's a bit like Facebook. Uh, I, I know Facebook well. I know the business model well. I was just uh, very slow in finally grabbing or coming to the party there. Tesla, on the other hand, uh, another company that, that I, I really like and, and have listened a lot to the, uh, to the quarterly results, uh, I guess because Elon Musk is South African and read the annual reports as well. To me, Tesla was an absolute screaming buy when the market was negative on it at $200 a share, but now it's at $350 a share. Um, and if Elon Musk doesn't start delivering at some point, he does threaten uh, losing the magical uh, approach. And when that happens, who knows where the share price could go to. So Tesla's just become a little bit too high risk. But BYD, in the same market, they also produce batteries for cars. Uh, so they, they also are exposed to the seismic shift away from the internal combustion engine. That is one that I'd be looking at next door to Baidu and, and definitely Alibaba. Thanks. I have a quick question on US interest hikes. Do, how do you think it will affect the portfolio if they come through? You know, it's all a, a question of uh, quantum. In classical uh, um, investment theory, it's based, uh, uh, classical investment theory is based on the, on the reality that you have different options that you can invest in. You can invest in equities, you can invest in fixed interest, or you can invest in property. Now, property and fixed interest, generally speaking, are related, um, and property will benefit when interest rates are low, uh, because then your property yields, relatively speaking, are better. Uh, but when interest rates rise, property uh, comes into, or, or finds the going a lot less easy. Um, because the alternative, risk-free, uh, becomes more appealing than the alternative of buying into a property where there is obviously the risk of default, etc. And it's a similar thing with stock markets. When interest rates rise, they have a negative impact on stock market and on market prices as a whole. But you have to look at the stock market, and particularly the United States stock market now, very differently to the way that you looked in the past. We have this clutch of exponential companies, businesses that grow at 20% plus per annum. And it looks like uh, they will continue to grow at that level for many years into the future, Amazon being an obvious example. Then you have other companies that are also listed on the US stock market who are contracting in their sales, contracting in their potential because the economy is changing. Technology is making them uncompetitive. If you consider, for instance, internal combustion engines or, or motor vehicle manufacturers who make engines that rely on petrol, they at the moment have to be looked at as a sunset industry because at some time in the next 20 years they're going to stop producing internal combustion engines now they have to make that switch to electric vehicles and some of them are doing it quite successfully we've seen toyota's doing pretty well bmw seems to be on that path um, and nissan uh, but it is a huge leap from the one type of business to another type of business and not all of them survive. We don't know too many companies uh, from the era where they used to make buggies and uh, people used to breed horses for transport. Uh, and the cars, of course, wiped out that whole sector. Uh, and horses, I think, are down to something like 10% of the number that was around in the United States uh, before the motor vehicles uh, arrived. So you have these ebbs and flows that go through all the time. And I think we need to just 
bear that in mind that you can't say buy the market or is the market expensive um, and is the market going to come back because interest rates are going to rise as you used to be able to do. Now you have to look within stock markets for those companies that are impervious to economic swings and the economic tides because their own business model, their own growth model is exponential. Thanks, Alec. Uh, just before we wrap up, a nice one to finish off, one, off with. Ronnie wants to know, how can he invest in this portfolio? Ronnie, the way to do it is to uh, open your web trader or open an account with web trader at Standard Bank. They give you the ability to invest or that account gives you the ability to invest anywhere in the world. And uh, I think they've got well, a couple of dozen at least stock markets that are available to you. The other, the good thing about uh, Web Trader as well, and and you can, if you, if it's not possible directly through Web Trader, um, I know through my recent roadshow with Standard Bankers, they've got a new app called Shift, and literally you can put a million rand, up to a million rand, no questions asked, into Shift, and then convert that or move it, change it into US dollars, um, and take those US dollars and put them into a portfolio. But you're going to have to replicate. The portfolio yourself. Uh, there isn't a Standard Bank don't have an identical portfolio like this that you can just put your money into, um, which they will replicate for you. They are we use this with Standard Bank as a model portfolio, um, so it's something for you to to look at, to replicate, and then to apply your um, your resources accordingly. But the advantage or the nice thing about this is that every month. Uh, we get together on the webinar and I can keep uh, keep you updated with how the portfolio is going, where the concerns are. And you can hear right now, I'm sure you, you got it, that I am concerned about Alphabet, I'm concerned about Facebook, and I'm very concerned about Tesla. Those are the three stocks in this portfolio that if I was buying a brand new uh, from start today, I'd be wondering uh, whether or not uh, to go into them. Because as they stand right now, I certainly cannot see uh, a case for buying those three shares at the current prices forever. Uh, Tesla is just too high risk. Uh, it's bouncing around all over the place. It's gone from three hundred dollars odd to three nearly sixty at the moment uh, in the last few weeks, and it it just needs to settle down uh, into some kind of no semblance of normality. Also, for that to have happened after some pretty mediocre uh, quarterly results, where once again the promises weren't met. Uh, it was concerning me, and I've articulated the other two. But outside of those three stocks, I'd be very happy holding the rest of them. Thanks, Eric. Just on Shift, I'm not sure if you have the answer to this. Fritz wants to know if they pay interest if they transfer to Shift. No, no, it's not an interest-bearing account. It's uh, it is just a a vehicle through which you, I guess, can trade currencies if that's uh, or hedge yourself in. You can't really trade the currencies but you can hedge yourself against uh, currency movements. So shift right now, if you put a million rand in, you'd be getting an 1160 against the US dollar. The idea then would be to use those US dollars and to invest in a portfolio like this one. Excellent. Thanks, Alec. I think that's all from my side. Well, that's it. And uh, we spot on uh, one hour. Thank you again for joining us uh, today for the portfolio. Or the um, don't, don't forget that tomorrow, uh, they're coming thick and fast this month. Usually what we try to do is to have the SA Champions portfolio wrap up in the middle of the month and the global portfolio at the end of the month. Well, we're going to be talking tomorrow about the SA Champions. Um, so please join us again then. Um, the From next month, we'll have SA Champions mid-month and uh, the global portfolio as always at the end of the month, just to give you a nice little bit of break between the two, some big changes in the SA Champions portfolio tomorrow, which shouldn't surprise you if you've been following it for a while, given that uh, we believe that the, the direction in the South African RAND is fundamentally going to be different now. It's it's had most of its run, uh, but uh, it's, it's unlikely, uh, given that economic sense is coming back to the management of the South African economy, uh, it, to us now, you you can't. We wouldn't be betting against 
uh, the economic policy makers. Uh, in other words, we wouldn't be betting against the South African RAND. And that's the bet that we've been carrying uh, in the SA Champions portfolio for a long time. So it's time now to readjust and uh, we'll, we'll give you all that information tomorrow. Thanks for being with us. And uh, from my end in a very chilly, in fact, snowy London, I wonder if I showed you this, if you could see it. Let's have a look. Let's have a look if you can see that. Okay, hopefully you can see me now. I'm going to try and push it out the window. Stuart, can you see the snow or is it, is it uh, too far away? Uh, no, can't see it. Alec, it looks, yeah, unfortunately. It, just, it does look cold, but not. <laughs> it's, it's cold and it is snowing. You can almost, if you just focus on that uh, tabletop, you'll see that it's getting whiter and whiter. Uh, extraordinary for us South Africans because we never, we hardly ever, we were talking about it the other day. I think we saw snow in Johannesburg twice. Uh, but anyway, here we, we're seeing it come down quite quickly. Very cold over here. Enjoy sunny South Africa and look forward to being back with you next month. Thanks, Alec. Cheers all.